Okay, well thanks for joining me again for this, uh, the second installment of Winter Botany here at Crellin Park. If you've done the first installment, then you'll know how the game goes. But if you haven't, there's no problem. You can step right in and do the first and second installments. So the way that this works is I put up colored flags around the forest, and some of those are what I call study trees. Those are the trees which I tell you what they are, and you can go out with your bud cards and identify them and, and learn them. And then there are the quiz trees, which are the ones that I don't immediately tell you what they are, but you can go out and quiz yourself and then look up the answers. So last time I did this, I put up pink flagging, and those flags are staying up. That's the first set of, bud car of buds and trees that you'll identify. This time I'm going to be putting up yellow flagging, and those numbered yellow flags are going to be another set of trees. Now some of those are going to be kind of tricky, uh, and I hope you relish the chance to actually dig a little deeper and you know, amaze your friends by the trees you can identify in winter. Some of them are going to be easy, common trees, and that's just an important addition to your repertoire. So go out, find those numbers, tr numbered trees, study them, do the quiz. As last time, the information for this is available online at our website. And what you'll find there is a map of where the trees are, both from last time and from this time. And you'll also find a set of bud cards. And what I've done is I've increased the number of trees that are in that set of bud cards. But I didn't take out the first set either. So what that means is that in the, the set for this time, you're gonna have all the trees from last time plus the trees from this time. So it's going to take a little bit more uh, paging through, but I hope it also serves to remind you of what you learned last time. Again, if you have any questions or problems with this, just don't hesitate to get in touch. And thanks for joining me. All right, so this is a fun set of trees, and it makes me think a little bit of going north, going up into Canada. Uh, only partially with reason. <laughs> um, one of the reasons is we've got some aspen here. So we have quaking aspen, which extends all the way up into Alaska. It's widely distributed. It takes up a lot of forest, or is found in a lot of forest uh, throughout the northern part of the United States and throughout Canada. We also have a birch here. Now, white birch is widely distributed. It does go quite far north. Uh, this actually happens to be a gray birch and is much more restricted to the northeast. So kind of an interesting little difference in there. The other thing we have in here is what's called big tooth aspen, which is actually not nearly as widely distributed as the quaking aspen or the trembling aspen. Those are the same thing. The big tooth aspen actually is found, you know, in the along the Appalachians and then kind of along the the uh, Canadian-US border, We're going obviously on both sides of that. So I'm gonna show you those three trees right here. The big tooth aspen, quaking aspen, AKA trembling aspen, and the gray birch. And then we'll show you the white birch uh, once we get down the forest. It actually doesn't happen to be any here. So let's start with the gray birch. This is probably what often gets called white birch. Now white birch and paper birch are the same thing. Those are two names for the same type of tree. This is gray birch. Very similar uh, when you look at it uh, as a standing tree to white birch. Now the difference is, there are slight differences in the bark. It tends not to be as peely. It tends to have perhaps more notable chevrons, these dark marks here above the branches, although actually, to be honest, this shows up a lot in uh, books as an ID characteristic. It doesn't work particularly well for me. The chevrons sometimes are quite prominent, at least to my eye, on white birch as well. Uh, a couple of things, or at least one thing, you can see that will help you, from a distance, guess that this is gray birch, and that's that these are growing in clusters. So you'll see that this is a relatively small tree, quite, use that word again, wispy, quite delicate. Um, and it tends to grow in clusters and clumps. It also tends to like growing in fields. So if you see a set of relatively small white birch looking 
trees in a field growing together, you're probably looking at gray birch. Now there is, kindly enough, there is a very easy way of telling them apart, and that's with the leaf shape. So if you dig around here, you'll find, and I'll show you a picture of this, there will be a picture accompanying me on this, uh, you find a triangular leaf that looks like that. Very, very pointed at the end, big wide base. That's typical of gray birch. The, the leaves of white birch, again I'll show you later, are more egg-shaped, not nearly as triangular or maybe as teardrop. Well, anyway, whatever you want to call that, uh, but not nearly this shape. So that's, that's gray birch, also sometimes called old field birch. Um, as birch do, this has catkins on it. These, these will be the flowers for this coming spring here on the branch tips. Gray birch. Now, we also have in here a couple different species of aspen. Now, aspen are these other, these other more grayish trees in here. They sometimes have a very light bark and can remind you of paper birch or white birch. So this is a kind of confusing family in here. Uh, they will tend, they don't peel, their bark will not peel. The bases as they get older will get not as smooth, they will get more gnarly. Um, but they will sometimes have, and you can see it here, their, their smooth bark sometimes has this kind of green sheen to it. And they're actually capable of carrying out photosynthesis uh, in their bark. It's not just an algae that's on the surface, although it can sometimes be that as well. Uh, but it, they're actually carrying out photosynthesis through their bark. So we have two kinds of aspen here, big tooth aspen, and we have the quaking aspen. Now, really, you can tell them apart perhaps sometimes a little bit by habitat. The uh, big tooth aspen tends to occur on slightly drier sites, but the quaking aspen certainly doesn't mind being on some of those sites, and we've got them intermixed here. So habitat will give you a little bit of a hint if you're in dry forest, you see some aspen, I'd probably think first of, of the big tooth aspen, but should double check. So one of the ways that's really going to help you to tell this apart between the big tooth aspen and the quaking aspen is to look at the buds. Now the buds on quaking aspen are this dark rich brown and they're shiny. They look like they've been varnished. Very pointed. Uh, they tend to almost be skinny, relatively skinny, elongate, and not, not as long as, a, say, a beach or something, who we'll meet later, uh, but definitely relatively, relatively slim. Slim, polished, pretty neat looking. Big Tooth Aspen, their buds don't have that polish to them. They're also relatively pointed. They're a little bit stouter, a little bit rounder, and they have this gray patina on them. They almost look like they've been dusted with, well, for this season, confectionery sugar. And so they turn out, they're, they're grayish. They don't have this deep, rich chocolate luster to them. So that's one difference. Quaking Aspen has those shiny, dark buds. Big Tooth Aspen, Big Tooth Aspen has those grayish buds. And then the other thing, if you remember, we talked about whole tree ID. So that means you don't just focus on the buds, but dig around. Look at what's down on the ground. And I already showed you the leaf of the gray birch. The leaves of big tooth aspen and quaking aspen, as you might expect, are distinct. Now one thing before we look at the difference between those two that you should know and that helps you is that quaking aspen Big Tooth Aspen and Cottonwood, who we'll meet later, are all in the genus Populus. And the, the trees in the genus Populus, their leaves have flat stalks. So it's, I know it's hard to see in the, in the film, but this, this part of the leaf is flattened in this plane. So it waves, it quakes this way easily, it does not do so well 
backwards and forwards because, as I said, it's flattened in this plane. Uh, and that holds true of big tooth aspen, holds true of caking aspen, and holds true of cottonwood. Now, to tell the two apart, big tooth aspen, luckily enough, has big teeth. So what you're looking at are the size of the teeth along the edge here. <clears throat> big tooth aspen looks like one of those giant rip saws. Uh, so, you know, relatively few teeth, quite big teeth. That's big tooth aspen. Quaking aspen almost just has ripples along the edge. So it has lots of little teeth and that's typical of quaking aspen. The leaves are very distinct. You can tell them apart easily. Now in a situation like this where it's intermixed, you know, if you think, oh, I have quaking aspen and trembling aspen, well, at least if you find both kinds of leaves, you'll know that you're right on that general score. And then actually, I just happened to, to look down. There is a broken branch here, <clears throat> which is still attached to one of these trees. And that gives you a little bit of a hint too, because you can you can then associate the leaves with the buds. So look, at, look for whatever you can find when you're doing this. Uh, and just to show you, this is the cottonwood leaf, uh, also in the genus Populus, a much bigger leaf, uh, has sort of tooth, teeth size that's intermediate between quaking aspen and big tooth aspen. Certainly doesn't have the rip saw of the big tooth aspen, but it also doesn't have just the little ripples of the quaking aspen. So this is cottonwood, tends to become a much bigger tree. You find it along creeks, and we'll see some of that later. But I just wanted to bring it up because it's the same genus, and if you notice, it also has a stalk that's very flattened in this plane. So it also wiggles in the wind very easily. So that's it, an introduction to some of the trees you'll find generally in these are all trees of younger forest. You'll find them, as I said, gray birch likes to come into fields, old fields. Aspen also have no trouble growing up in open areas. They tend to not be very long lived. And so, you know, once a forest is pushing 100 years old, they will tend to die out in that forest. Okay, first set. This one might look a little bit familiar. Uh, it might remind you a bit of gray birch. This is white birch. And so already you can notice some things. One is, we're not really out in the middle of a field. Now, white birch definitely comes in where there's burns, where there's clear cuts. Uh, doesn't seem to be quite as much of an old field invader as the gray birch is. The other thing you'll notice is this is really the only one in the neighborhood and it's not that you don't get stands of white birch, you do, but rather they tend to grow as individual trees rather than as clusters as tree, of trees. They also tend to get a bit bigger. They don't have this almost weeping willow-like appearance. They tend to be a bit um, more single-trunked and definitely sturdy. So <clears throat> you notice right off the bat that you have the, the paper paper miss here, so another name for this is paper birch, because this peels off in such nice paper, uh, which also makes great kindling. Now, it's a little bit hard to tell. The, the buds you would see up there are not all that distinct from those of gray birch, but if you remember, I had mentioned the leaves. Now, the leaves are different, and here, <clears throat> that's the gray birch leaf, which I showed you last time. And here is the white birch, or paper birch leaf. More of an oval appearance. Doesn't have that long, that long tip. So gray birch, white birch. Again, you're in a forest. You see a single big white barked tree with the peeling on it. And then you dig around. And now the, the truth is that the the leaves of white birch decay quite rapidly. It took me a bit of digging, actually. It looks like 
some turkeys have been through, but it was actually me digging for leaves to find one of these. Um, so they, they do decay relatively rapidly. The other thing is they're not all that different in shape from, say, hop hornbeam, which is also in this forest. But you're not finding any of these long-tipped leaves, which would indicate gray birch. So white birch, as I said, it tends to grow in, in part, where there have been burns. And so one neat thing to do is to look at old, to look at train tracks, essentially, because you often had fires burning along train tracks, not only in the era of wood-fired locomotives, when you had the sparks, but also you get sparks just from the wheels passing, <coughs> excuse me, and from the brakes sometimes jamming up. I remember one, one train that went through that had a jam brake in the middle of summer, and it just sort of lit a fire all along the tracks, and so the fire departments were running up and down the tracks putting that out. But sometimes you'll see stands of white birch near railroad tracks, possibly because you had a fire right near those tracks. As I mentioned, this is a widespread spread tree, much more widespread than gray birch growing up into, um, well up into Canada. Uh, it is associated with birch bark canoes, and my understanding is that they would actually make long slits, peel off in sheets the bark, not just the, <coughs> not just this paper, but also the, the whole inner bark, and then those would be used actually with the inside out, so the, the rough side would be on the inside of the canoe, the smoother side on the outside, stitched together, uh, sealed, and that would form a nice light canoe. Another thing I wanted to mention is that I have my cheat sheet, and oops, I have a a book on, on trees, and I would urge you, if you get into this, to get a book on trees. Don't worry about getting a book that necessarily is made just for winter. I would actually almost encourage you not to get a winter book as your first one. There's some great books out there that can be really helpful for winter buds um, and bark and all that sort of thing. But I would say get a good general book first. And by that I mean a book that's going to have pictures of leaves, hopefully some pictures of buds, distribution maps, photos of bark, and some text describing a little bit the ecology and the, the distribution and the uses, perhaps. Because, again, the reason you're doing this is to get to learn the personalities in the forest. And so if you've got your little book of personalities, your little set of biographies, then as you go into the forest, you can start associating the names with information and checking you know, does what the book says, does that, does it actually pan out in what you see in the forest? I realize there might be a technological challenge here because I have the stream in the background, but I wanted to do this intentionally heading or facing towards the stream because these trees that I'm talking about now are typical of these floodplain forests. You're really not going to see them far away from a stream or a river. And one we've already met, and that's the sycamore, which is here. And I just realized I hadn't actually, I think, showed you a sycamore leaf. But if you notice, it has almost a maple uh, tree leaf-like shape, almost a maple leaf-like shape, uh, although it has these lobes coming down. kind of looks like a... Uh, Lord of the Rings version of a maple leaf. But that's the sycamore. Uh, these big trees with, remember, that characteristic bark that I mentioned. The tree, the new tree that I wanted to introduce is this even bigger one behind me. And that bigger one behind me is the one I mentioned earlier on, and that's cottonwood. That's one of the ones that's in the family of the, the aspen. It's also the genus Populus, so that the big tooth aspen and the quaking aspen that I mentioned earlier are close relatives of cottonwood. Although, as I said, cottonwood is really a tree of floodplain forests and, and stream edges. So, one thing that actually gives it away, and as I look through this forest, really some of the biggest trees are cottonwood. They just, for some reason, they tend to get to be really stout trees. They grow very quickly, and that's just how they establish themselves. They, they tend to be really, really big trees. 
they have quite a thick, rigid bark. I wouldn't say it's completely distinctive, but it's definitely not the same as sycamore, which is the other big tree, another big tree you're likely to get down here. And it actually almost reminds me a little bit of chestnut oak, which is a tree that we might meet later on. Uh, but chestnut oak tends to be up on slightly higher ground. So there's some here along the, the, the banks of the creek. So this deep, rigid bark, a large tree, floodplain, all those pieces of evidence get you thinking that maybe this is cottonwood. And that's when you start digging around on the ground. And indeed, cottonwood leaves are, are at least more solid than the birch leaves. And so you're likely to find them. And what you want to look for again, and I showed you before, is this aspen-like leaf. It's got that flattened stalk, and it's got these, you know, medium-sized leaves. Sorry, medium-sized teeth, I should say, on the leaf. Um, that's cottonwood. There's also a little bit of a clue. It's kind of hard to see, but right here, at the very base of the leaf blade, there's actually some glands. And if you rub your fingers, now my eyes are getting worse, so I use my fingers more than my eyes sometimes. But if you rub your fingers here, you'll see that there's actually a, little, a couple of little bumps there at the base of the leaf blade. And those are little glands that you find on the leaves of cottonwood. But really, there's no other leaf that you're going to fly, find in the floodplain forest other than perhaps uh, if you have some aspen nearby, but that has this flattened stalk. And then if you, if you get familiar with the degree of toothing around the edges, you'll feel pretty confident that you're looking at the cottonwood. Now, as some, as you, as some of you may well know, uh, the reason it's called cottonwood is because in the spring, when the seeds disperse, you have what looks like cotton flying through the air. The other name that I would have used is snow tree because actually I've been in places where there's such a dense drop of cottonwood seeds it's actually the cotton is not the seed itself. The seeds are actually in with the cotton, but the cotton is what makes those seeds float and disperse. I've been in places where you have such a thick drop of that cotton that it almost looks like it is snow. You just have this whiting across the ground. So cottonwood, fun tree, riverside tree, big tree. not such a typical floodplain forest tree. It tends to be a tree of rich woods, but not necessarily places that get flooded. We're up here on a bank, so this is not a, an area that gets regularly flooded. As much as that hemlock, we've got sugar maple. Those are good companions of this tree. This is beech, American beech. And it is one of those ones where the bark can often really help you. So when it's healthy, and that's big if, <coughs> it tends to have a very smooth bark, very tight, very smooth. It's, a t it's the bark that people like to carve their initials into. And one of the little mind games that helps me with this sometimes is Beach is similar to the word Buch in German, and Buch, as it sounds like, is book. And so people write on this tree as they might write in a book. So this very smooth bark that tends to be typical of beech, often going to be fairly big trees. One of the sad things, and you might start, you might be starting to see it right there, uh, is there's what's called beech bark disease, and that is a fungus that affects beech. And you see it in that bark. The bark loses its smoothness and becomes much more rough and eventually the tree will die. What you often see around trees that have that is lots of root shoots coming up. Lots of young beech, because the roots are not immediately filled. Lots of young beech coming up, but it's the big trees that get effect affected by that beech bark disease. So I just panned around from that large beech to this smaller beech, this several smaller beech. Uh, there's a couple of things that are really gonna help you understand if you're looking at beach and kind of confirm in your mind. So a couple of things that are going to help you. 
with ability to see. One is that, as with some of the other trees we've seen, such as the oak, beech is one of the trees that likes to hold on to its leaves during the winter. So if you're in a forest and you see trees with light, relatively light, smooth bark that have these tannish leaves still on them, then that's you know, a good hint that you might be having uh, an American beach. The other thing is the leaves themselves, um, you get a good chance to look at them. They're, they're relatively large, oval, sort of in some ways standard leaf shape. But one of the things that I notice is their texture. So they're, they're, to me, very papery, almost like wrapping paper. I know you can't hear it, but as I'm doing this, they're crinkling, you know, they're sort of rattling almost. Um, so that, that papery leaf, another, another way of connecting the name book or book, beach, to leaf is to think of the leaves as being papery. Um, the other thing that will help you is to look at the buds, the shape of the buds. And I know this is perhaps not the first analogy that comes to mind, but I think the buds look a lot like gnome cigars. So if you picture a little tiny gnome puffing on a cigar, they're long, they're cigar shaped, and they have a wrapping as if they were a wrapped cigar. So that those long, brownish buds are typical of beech. And there's really no other tree in our forest that has buds of that shape. As I mentioned, the American beech is a tree of mature forests on good soil. So you're not going to find it on really dry hillsides. You're not going to find it down in a real lowland where it's always wet. You're going to find it on deep, moist soils uh, that have not recently, or ever perhaps, been cut and completely open. So they're a, they're a, a tree of mature or even ancient forests. You find them together with hemlock, for example, yellow birch. Those are good indicators of a mature, old, I won't necessarily say old growth. Some people may have gone in and done logging in there, but of a forest that has been a forest for a long time. So this is our last birch of the set, and this is perhaps the one that you'll be most surprised to find is actually a birch. So this is black birch, we had white birch, gray birch, and now we have black birch. This is a birch that's probably more common than you realize in the forest, because it's kind of a nondescript, retiring sort of a tree. Black birch, one of the ways you can tell that it's black birch is that it actually does have a birchy bark, although it doesn't peel, um, but it does have this, this bark that sometimes is almost approaching shiny, not quite, but almost, has these horizontal, what are called lenticels, these horizontal lines here, which are actually perforations of the bark, where gas can go in and out for the metabolism of the tree. So black birch has a not surprisingly, black birch has a dark bark. And then as you start looking at it, it has these catkins. This is typical of, of birch. That it, they will have the, the catkins on them, especially you know, at this time of year, which is uh, in winter and into the spring. And then the, the catkins, well, they'll, they'll actually stay. They will just grow and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, grow and mature. Another characteristic when you look at the branches is the wispiness of them, the, the suppleness of them. So as I, I mentioned to you when I was talking about the rough grouse, you know, these are not branches you necessarily want to try to stand on, even if you're only a teapot. And then they have what are called spur shoots. So it's these short little branches coming out of the twig. There's a bud on the end. And if you look up, you realize it almost makes the, the twig look jagged or look as though it has thorns. These are not thorns, but it kind of looks that way because you've got lots of these little short branches coming out. And that's typical of birches. So, and another thing, I didn't, I haven't, we haven't mentioned it so far today, but remember that opposite alternate. Now all the trees we've seen so far today are alternate. So that means, again, you've got a bud up here, 
nothing across from it. A butt down here, the next butt is down here, the next butt is down here. So these are alternate trees, or alternate budded trees, alternate branched trees as well. Um, so the, another thing with black birch, and this is not something that's um, appropriate to do during the time of COVID, so I won't encourage you to do it on this communal tree that I've flagged, but if you find another one off in the forest that you think is black birch, it's something worth doing. And that is if you just take your fingernail and scratch the twig until you see green and then smell it, you'll get that wintergreen smell. Now some people say it's root beer, so and, and indeed birch beer um, comes from black birch. Um, but some people say it's toothpaste smell, but it's that it has a very nice, fresh wintergreen smell. And that's typical of black birch. You do not get it on white birch. You do not get it on gray birch. You do get it in the other birch that we'll not be seeing today, which is yellow birch. Uh, but yellow birch would have a more golden uh, bark that's also more peely. It's a little bit more like paper birch in the sense that you have those flakes of thin bark coming off, which you do not have on black birch. Black birch is a tree that I think of as a tree of middle-aged forests. So it's not one that's going to be running into a field to establish itself. You don't usually see it in that context so much. Uh, you also don't necessarily find it all that often, at least around here, in very old forests. But what you find is sort of these middle-aged forests where something has opened the forest up at some point and the, and the birch can, uh, black birch have come in. They can get to be relatively big, they can get to be relatively old, uh, but again, they're more a tree that I think of as a middle-aged forest. One of the things I mentioned last time that you have this woolly adelgid that has been attacking hemlocks. So in some places, a lot of hemlocks have died. You've had an opening up of the forest. Uh, one of the trees that tends to come in in that situation has been black birch. Uh, so a nondescript tree in some ways, a sweet-smelling tree, one that really is worth knowing because you'll, I think you'll come to the conclusion it's more common than you realized it was. One last thing I wanted to say also uh, at this tree, and it, it actually applies to all the trees, is really tree identification in winter or in summer at any time is not a speed sport. It's not a competition. Think of it, you know, approach a tree as if you're about to have tea with it. You're sitting down for tea and cookies with a tree and you're going to get to know it better. You know, again, think about the habitat, think about the bar, think about the buds, and then just forget about thinking about the tree and just breathe deeply and you know, think about the forest you're in. So really, take your time. I have made numerous times the mistake of just jumping to a conclusion and saying, oh, that's a that, only to realize that, no, that is not a that, it's a this. And so uh, take your time, enjoy it, and get to know the forest better. next tree we're going to do is this one in here. And it's a one whose bark has sadly become more characteristic in the past few years. So this is ash. Uh, I think in this case it's white ash, but we won't worry about the different kinds of ashes at this point. Um, ash in general tends to have a tight but ridged bark. So ignoring these lighter patches, ignoring these lighter patches for a bit, uh, you will have this very tight furrowing that's really typical of, of ash. Now, what you also notice now are these light patches on, on this tree. And if you were to come closer, it almost looks like somebody has taken a knife and sort of flicked some of these bark pieces off. That knife was actually a woodpecker's beak. And that woodpecker, if you come up and look at this more closely, and I'll show you some photographs, if you look at it more closely, where these flicks have come off, you'll see there are little holes. And these are the holes of emerald ash borer. So woodpeckers have been going after the larvae of, of emerald ash borer. 
they've been flicking the bark off and that's exposed this younger not so weathered bark that gives the tree this sort of tan speckling and sadly enough in many of our forests you can pick out the ash from a distance because of this speckling these ash probably will not survive um, because the emerald ash borer will eventually kill them off now the younger trees don't get it so I'm saying this individual tree will probably not survive. The species may have a better chance of staying around uh, because those younger trees are able to, uh, well, they, do, they actually are not affected by the emerald ash borer until they get to a certain size. Okay, in the spirit of not jumping to conclusions, you want to take a little time and actually look at the branches of this tree. and and see if you can't get some other evidence that's going to let you feel comfortable saying that this is ash. And one of the things is that this is an opposite twigged or opposite leaved tree. And so you'll see that many of the branches, when you look up, are opposite each other. Now they're not all, some of them have broken off, as I say, but you can see that many times they are opposite. You can also see little sort of hairs coming off the ends of the twigs where they, uh, where the seeds used to be. These are the little stalks that the seeds once were attached to. And the other opposite trees, as we have mentioned, this is where you'd have the, the quiz if you were here. Um, the other opposite trees in our forest are most commonly maple. Now, obviously you get the dogwood and you know um, horse chestnut, which is not a native. Uh, but if you were to be looking up into a maple, you'd find the twigs to be much more delicate, whereas these trees are re really pretty sturdy. And I think of those twigs as looking like, they, like they've been stuck on there like tinker toys. Um, they've just been stuck into that thick middle branch. So the branching pattern uh, gives you a hint. And then, as you know, The buds had better also be opposite. Um, and I've just had this handy dandy sky hook here. This is really basic, but it actually does help. So if you find a twig on the ground and you don't feel like jumping up and down and uh, looking as though you're bouncing on a trampoline, then you can just reach up and pull that down. What you find when you look at this is that indeed the buds are opposite. So. You have a bud here, and across from that you have another bud. A bud here, or what was once a bud, and another one across from it. Again, so this is an opposite bud, budded, an opposite branched tree, typical of the ash. The other thing to look at is the, the point, the, the end bud, which is very rounded. So again, it, if you're thinking in terms of the, the opposite leafed trees, you might be thinking, oh, maybe this is a maple. But if you look at that, take some time and look at that end bud. And to me, it reminds me of, the, of a bishop's mitre, you know, those hats that they wear. Um, it's kind of semi-conical on the end and clasping quite tight. And that's typical of ash. Now we also get red ash, green ash here. We get black ash. Um, we won't go into separating those out because I think if you if you just get to recognize Ash, you're doing pretty good. So here, in between all these vines, is black cherry. Now I know a couple of people in the comments on the first, um, the first installment, the first installment of trees. Uh, we're saying, well, why did I choose trees that look almost dead or seem to be in trouble? Um, one reason that I chose some of these trees is because some of their branches are down low, so you have a chance of looking at their buds. And when it's a big forest tree, uh, that becomes more difficult. Um, so the tree, let's just talk about the, the tree that's in here first before we say anything about the vines. So the tree that's in here is black cherry. And it has, here's another one where the bark is really, once you get to recognize it, is going to be probably good enough for you. Although you want to double check it, but um, it has what 
The analogy we use is burnt tortilla chip bark. So it looks like you've got these little burnt tortilla chips. Um, it tend, so they're not quite charcoal black, but relative to the other bark in the forest, you'll see it's a darker bark, a grayer rather than a browner bark, sort of a, yeah, a, a dark gray color. And it has this very typical flaking on it. So once it gets to be a big tree, dark bark, flaking, it's one of those trees you can pretty much pick out just on the hoof. Uh, some comments on the vines that are around here. We have mainly here, we've got Oriental Bittersweet, which is sadly a vine that can kill this tree. It, it, will, it is a strangler, so as it grows up, it wraps around the tree, and that can, in the same way that barbed wire or uh, you know, steel chain could strangle a tree over the years, so too can Oriental Bittersweet. Uh, you do have, <clears throat> here behind me, you've got some grape, which is another vine, but it has a, a more um, shreddy bark on it. That is not a strangler. So yes, sometimes it can get to be big enough that it will weigh on the tree. It might sh throw shade on the tree, but it's not going to strangle the tree directly. Uh, so it's a native. The, the uh, grape, Oriental Bittersweet, is not a native and tends to damage these trees. Now, Oriental Bittersweet has these lovely red berries, which are often used in holiday decorations, um, which is fine, just as long as you don't then throw them out behind your house and get a whole set of these growing up again. So anyway, the, the black cherry has a really rich wood. It's a, it's a beautiful colored wood, great for making furniture. Talking about oriental bittersweet and plants that are not native in our landscape, it's sometimes interesting to realize that some of our plants um, are invasive in other places. In other words, they, they grow in other places where they were not native and maybe sort of elbow out some of the native species. And surprisingly enough, black cherry is one of them. In Great Britain it apparently grows in very thick stands and the understanding is that really here in the North America um, there in the soil microbiology there are certain microorganisms that discourage thick growths of black cherry. So you tend to see it, you know, there's one here, there's another one down the hill, there's another one over here. It's not that they're not somewhat near to each other but they're not growing in thick stands. So I realize the main thing you probably see in this shot are the red berries of the bittersweet. Uh, but you'll see some pictures of the cherry buds. So again, you know, put the pieces together. This is an alternate leafed, an alternate branched tree. It's got the, you know, a twig here, another twig up here. The buds are one here, there's one a little bit farther down. In other words, it's standard opposite, I mean, sorry, standard alternate leaf configuration. So this is a, an alternate leafed tree. Um, it has relatively small buds and they, they tend to have, even at this time of year, in between the brown of the scales you often see a little bit of green, a hint of green, we'll say. Um, so they're kind of, they have dark bud scales and they've also got these light bud scales. Now this is another place where, you know, do it in the safety of your own home, don't do it here. Um, but if you were to scratch these twigs, you would get the smell of cherry. And the smell of cherry is very distinct. What it makes me think of is when my mom would, you know, take that spoonful of medicine that I really should have had, but didn't want to have, and say, open wide, and you just sort of go, you get this, this mouthful of, of bitterness, really. And that's, it's a very, it's a bitter, sharp smell. Uh, it's also the smell you'd associate with the taste of apple seeds. But it's a very typical smell, not only of this cherry, but really of any cherry. So it's a good, if you think you're seeing a cherry, a good first step is to do the scratch and sniff and see if in fact it has that very characteristic smell. And of course, cherries, as I'm sure you'd realize, have fruit. So they have very small fruits, about the size of a pea, uh, black, 
or very dark anyway, a large seed in them, but they're tasty. Birds will usually beat you to them, so once they're ripe and worth eating, they're not around very long, uh, but they're worth sampling now. So, black cherry. This is our other common evergreen. This is what's called red cedar. It's actually a juniper. So don't look for cones. Look for berries. They're actually in some ways derived from cones. But the, what you would find on here in the right season are little blue juniper berries, which are what is used to make gin, which is used to flavor gin anyway. Uh, they look like blueberries essentially, but they're but they're not like blueberries. Uh, so this is red cedar. Look at its needles, because really what it ends up looking as if is that the twigs had turned green. It's, they don't have the distinct needles that the white pine has, nor that the hemlock has. It's really, um, what has happened is the needles essentially are very short, at least on the mature trees, and they're oppressed, they're stuck to the, the little twig tips, the little uh, branch tips, and it makes it look as though really those twigs are green. So it's a, a very different, once you look at it up close, a very different architecture from the, the pines and the hemlock. Um, one thing that's quite typical this, of this is the bark. So it has a shreddy bark. So it's the kind of bark that if you're a bird and you want to make a nest, go to the red cedar and you'll find some good, some good uh, stuff to peel off the trunk and put in your nest. Another thing with red cedar is that, and a picture will make this more evident, but you see this little, it almost looks like a little raisined brain uh, here on the twig tip. It's a hard, wizened structure. Uh, that is the, the intermediate stage or the, the pre-fruiting stage of apple cedar rust, which is a fungus that affects apples and then and cedar, red cedar. Uh, not true cedar, but red cedar, juniper. And it, it requires two hosts. It goes back and forth between those two hosts. In the right time of year, in early spring, these little balls will grow really interesting orange octopus legs. So they, they send out these jelly-like, orange-like well, orange jelly-like um, legs or structures, which is where the spores of the fungus will eventually come from. Very distinct, very different, not what you'd expect. Red cedar is really, in some ways, an indicator in our landscape of former pasture land. Now, not always. I'm not saying that this necessarily was former pa pa pasture land. You get exceptions, you get people planting it, etc. But if this tree were to be smaller, and there is actually a red cedar near the parking lot, actually a red cedar near the, the aspen and birch that I initially uh, showed you and that you will look at, there's a small red cedar there. And if you were to go up and shake hands with it, you would be surprised how pointed it is. It's very sharp. And you can imagine if you're a cow or another herbivore, it's not something you really want to be chewing on. This, once they get bigger, once they're out of the, the height, out of the range of a ground herbivore, the, the foliage is pretty soft. I mean, you know, not necessarily saying you want to sleep on it, but it's, it's a relatively soft foliage. But you can understand why cows and other livestock avoid it when it's small. Uh, and they avoid it and then it grows up to this height and then it, it slowly will come into pastures and one thing that you see is you might have a, a cluster of red cedar and then in the middle of that you might have say an ash a tree that really is not protected from from livestock but once it's got its nursery once it's got its protective circle of red cedar around it then it can grow up coincidentally enough a tree whose whose posts whose logs are sometimes made into posts that would be used in fences around a pasture. So it's got a quite a durable wood that is uh, quite favored, in fact, for fence posts. <laughs>
All right, so that's uh, that's the end of this this set. Um, so remember, I've got the I've got flagging out. I've got yellow flags. All of these trees have been marked with a number of yellow flags, and there'll be some quiz trees as well. So look for those. Look for the map. Go to the website. Get the new and the latest set of cards. And I just want to wrap up by sort of <laughs> telling you a little bit of our ulterior motive here, and that's helping you get to get know this park better. And behind me right now, you see the community garden. And this is a place where if you're interested in raising vegetables, having a plot of land, you can get in touch, and I'll give you the contact information, you can get in touch with some people and get access to this. So just another aspect of Crown Park. All right, I hope you enjoy this. I hope you enjoy what we've done, and I'll see you next time. Good job. And just <laughs> say goodbye from the camera crew.